They say there are two kinds of people in this world. Those who find themselves and those who create themselves. Are you looking for purpose or deciding it for yourself? Will you plunge waiting for someone to catch you? Will you jump and build your wings on the way down? Seek a path or carve a path. Wait for the future or build it. What is a school but a set of walls waiting for greatness? And who are you but someone destined to achieve it? Here, between the street and the jungle, against time and tide, we push and pull just like the currents. Our ocean of dreams will meet the odds ahead and rise above it all. The University of Guam, Center for Island Sustainability, leads and supports the transition of our island region toward a sustainable future through research, education, protection and preservation, growth, partnerships, and inspiration. Follow us on our journey to creating a sustainable future for our island and our world. Hi everyone, welcome to the University of Guam virtual conference series on island sustainability. I'm your MC, Lauren Swaddell, and I'm the Guam Green Growth Coordinator from the University of Guam Center for Island Sustainability. This is the 11th annual conference that UOG is hosting, but the first time we're going virtual. We're excited to continue bringing Islanders and our allies together from around the world. We've had over 500 conference attendees from over 60 countries, states, and territories. And we've had over 4.2 thousand views on social media. Thank you for being part of our conference. For those joining us on Zoom, thank you for registering and participating. Please use the chat box to say hello and let us know who you are and where you're from. And for those viewing a live stream or a recording, thanks for watching. And if you'd like to engage live with other conference attendees, you can register at uog.edu slash CIS 2020. Oh, right here. The University of Guam would like to thank all our conference partners and sponsors. And I'd like to acknowledge all university and government dignitaries who are joining us today. This is week three of the conference series and for today's program, we'll go into the circular economy for islands. First, our UOG Center for Island Sustainability Director will give a brief overview of UOG's circular economy initiatives. Then, our first panel, Island Wisdom, looping back to the circular economy, will introduce the concept of circularity and its principles of designing out waste and pollution, keeping materials in use, and regenerating natural systems. Our second panel, Circular Economy Around the Islands, will feature circular economy entrepreneurs and practitioners in the Asia-Pacific region. Stick around for a 30-minute virtual reception where we'll network, have additional Q&A with the panelists, and talk about growing the circular economy in island communities. Now let's get started. Long ago on Guam, the center of the island was mysteriously wasting away. It was soon discovered that a giant fish was eating the land. The strongest men went out to sea to search for it, but over time could not find the fish. The women gathered together to help. They cut off their hair and wove it into a large net. They sang songs to lure the giant fish out of hiding and captured it. The men helped bring in the fish for a feast. Together, they saved Guam and secured its future for generations to come. Islands are not isolated. This is just one story of island wisdom that teaches we must all work together to face the threats to our planet and our future. Join the University of Guam virtual conference series on island sustainability as we present the theme, 
Island Wisdom for a Global Future. Welcome back. I'd like to introduce UOG Center for Island Sustainability Director, Dr. Austin Shelton, who will share some of UOG's circular economy initiatives. Off a day, everybody. Thank you again for joining us today at uh, the virtual conference series on island sustainability. Now, uh, the concept of the circular economy has been really interesting for us um, here in Guam since we started talking about it uh, maybe just a year and a half ago. And as we got more into the concept, we realized that it's something that's really ingrained already in island wisdom. It's just not something that we've been naming or, or uh, realizing that we were doing. But this is definitely something that we want to go back to, uh, loop back to, uh, in our island wisdom to ensure that we're having more economic opportunities and solving some really big sustainability challenges um, that I think um, you and different islands will also be experiencing. So one of the, the big, th big issues that we have here in Guam is that we import 90 to 95 percent of all of the food and goods that we consume. Um, so that's a, a huge over-reliance on imports. We're also producing way too much waste. So if you're a small island like ours, uh, there are only so many holes that you can dig in the ground and fill up with trash uh, before we run out of space. Uh, like this one in our ORDOT dump that closed 20 years overdue and it actually created a mountain. Um, we only have so many spots that we can fill like this. Uh, and also, if your, um, uh, your economy is also reliant on tourism, like we are here in Guam, uh, you're certainly seeing empty streets, hotels, and stores in your tourist areas. Uh, so this is, uh, these are some issues that we hope the circular economy will be able to, to help us address. And I'm just going to give you a quick overview of how we've, um, uh, what we've been doing so far since uh, we got a small kickstart back in August of 2019. We're in this network called the Global Consortium for Sustainability Outcomes, and we had a small grant to start stimulating circular economy industries and start meeting with partners like at the Arizona State University, who you'll hear from in the first panel, and the Kamehameha Schools based in Hawaii. Um, and so we have three components that we are using to advance the circular economy. The first is education and workforce development. So we're having workshops like this where we have uh, dozens of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs that are interested in this concept come in to learn uh, how they could advance the principles of the circular economy. Uh, we're also really happy with our partnership with the University of Guam School of Business and Public Administration. Uh, we've had for the past two semesters now uh, transformed the, um, their capstone course, which is called a snake pit competition um, that they do at the end of each semester, sort of like the Shark Tank TV show where the whole focus now is on the circular economy. And it's really fascinating to see the innovative ideas that our island students are coming up with um, to take waste and make it into resources, things like coconut shells, spent beer hops, uh, invasive species, um, really interesting ideas that actually have great business plans and can work. We're also working with the business incubator, the Guam Unique Merchandise and Art, who you'll hear from in uh, the first panel. And we're hoping that uh, we can work with them to provide training to entrepreneurs and show them how to also incorporate these concepts of the circular economy and in, fact, uh, in, a, in effect uh, stimulate these new circular industries. And finally, the third component is leveraging and creating new maker spaces to give uh, these uh, entrepreneurs the space to create uh, these products to go on the market. So things like 3D printers, CNC routers, furnaces, um, we we want to copy our friend uh, in uh, Matt Simpson and Kosh Rai a bit with uh, some of the paper making technologies that he may want to share. Uh, lots of things in, in plastic recycling uh, and upcycling as well. And so those are just the, the quick overview of what we're doing. We're also excited with the new uh, $20 million grant from the National Science Foundation for uh, Guam EPSCOR. There's going to be a cutting edge coral reef science that's going to be done, but we also have a workforce development component where we'll be working with all of these partners um, to advance the circular economy. And I also see the administrator of our Guam uh, Environmental Protection Agency on the conference today, and we're looking forward to partnering with, uh, with Walter and his team as well. So please reach out if you're interested in the circular economy. Uh, let's go on this journey together to transition our islands to a circular economy. So thanks very much uh, for listening to that. And uh, before we introduce the first panel, I, I'd like to uh, sh uh, have a, a special video message play from Andrew Morlay, who is the chief executive of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is a major leader in the circular economy space. 
If it wasn't midnight, currently where he is in the United Kingdom, he'd be with us here live today. Um, but we're really thankful that he took the time to um, share some of his thoughts on how the circular economy relates to our islands. So let's listen to his message together. Hello, I'm Andrew Morley, Chief Executive of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, which is based on the Isle of Wight uh, off the south coast of Great Britain in the English Channel. Uh, and I'm sorry I couldn't um, dial into your session today, but um, Austin gave me the opportunity to talk briefly about the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's role in the circular economy and its potential for contributing to the Pacific Islands uh, sustainability agenda. Uh, firstly, on the foundation, we were established in uh, 2010 with the objective of um, uh, developing and promoting the idea of a circular economy. And in 2012, we produced our first major report uh, published and released at the World Economic Forum. Uh, and in that, we presented the circular economy as a system solutions framework, uh, which had a, uh, a tremendous economic rationale behind it. And since then, we've gone on to develop 20 odd other reports, which also show the scale of that opportunity being a multi-trillion dollar economic opportunity, but much more broadly presenting all sorts of uh, benefits to society and to uh, the environment as a byproduct of that economic activity. And uh, we as an organization spend quite a lot of effort in uh, working on innovative um, approaches for scaling system solutions globally. And we've done quite a lot of work in the plastic space. We released the new plastics economy report in 2016 at the World Economic Forum again, uh, with the headline quote of business as usual in the plastics packaging world re resulting in more plastics in the ocean and fish by 2050. Uh, and as a result, uh, that report got um, more media coverage than any report ever released at the World Economic Forum and played an important role in mobilizing the uh, global awareness and, and focus on plastics uh, packaging pollution in the ocean, uh, which we uh, can see uh, today. And um, more broadly, we work on many other agendas uh, in the foundation. We work with, uh, with companies, uh, with, uh, with institutions, governments and cities around the world. We work in learning and communications. Uh, and we have um, aimed to be one of the global references for the topic of circular economy, uh, not only in theory, but also in uh, innovative approaches for mobilizing it at scale. Um, in terms of the opportunities in the uh, Pacific Islands, we can see that there is a, a, a tremendous opportunity really, not only because uh, the islands uh, have many of the problems that um, other countries, government cities have in, in dealing with the byproduct of a linear economy, the massive amounts of waste uh, that are produced, the pollution, the, um, the negative byproducts of that type of extractive economic model, um, and even more so because of the uh, small uh, geographic footprint of the islands, uh, your ability to deal with waste uh, in, in these systems. Um, and we can see that the all the various levers of the circular economy, whether it's around reuse or whether it's around repair, upgrade, remanufacturing, resale, uh, ultimately recycling, but the the ability to keep uh, the material materials that come into the um, island economies in use for longer at higher value and ultimately uh, in some way uh, returned to the system and kept out of the natural environment is is a real opportunity and I think that the the way to take this forward in many regards is not only at the national level at the at, at individual islands and island nations levels looking at what these leaders could uh, present as opportunities but also collectively uh, we think there's a real opportunity for uh, the Pacific Islands collectively to uh, take back to the producers of, of products and services the global brands and the global producers, um, a, a, a consolidated voice, if you will, representing the needs that you have for better product service solutions uh, that eliminate uh, plastic waste in the design of these products. So how could they uh, look at creating uh, much more effective product delivery solutions with take back models, uh, with reuse uh, models, with using biodegradable um, uh, packaging solutions and concentrates and the like uh, that could uh, meet the needs of, of people on the islands much better and, and by design eliminate the waste uh, that is inherent in today's system. Um, we have been promoting this uh, idea and working uh, with people such as SPREP and other organizations in, uh, in the region. Uh, we had hoped to be at the Our Oceans meeting in Palau 
this year, but unfortunately that has been uh, postponed. Um, and we're all now reworking our plans in terms of finding ways of engaging more locally. Uh, but I look forward to the opportunity of meeting with many of you when we are able to travel again and to uh, be able to work with you to bring the circular economy vision for the Pacific uh, region and islands uh, to uh, a reality. So uh, thank you and uh, good luck. Bye. Now I'd like to introduce the moderator of Island Wisdom looping back to the circular economy. Jackie Marathi is the chairwoman of the UOG Island Sustainability Community Advisory Board and the Senior Vice President and Chief Communications and Corporate Social Responsibility Officer at Bank of Guam. During the panel discussion, feel free to send your questions to the Q&A moderator in the chat and Jackie will try to ask the panelists some of your questions. Hello, Ms. Marathi, thank you for moderating our first panel. Good morning, half a day, and thank you again um, so much for having um, me. I think it's a, a great opportunity to host here locally, and I'm really thrilled to be able to join in on the circular economy conversation. Uh, the key question really is, how are islands uh, as natural living labs, how are we able on a very small scale, able to learn and influence how um, a number of uh, conversations are going on with regard to the circular economy. What I'll do is I'll introduce our various panelists and we're very honored to have them all here with us um, and then go straight into the questions and answers. So if you have questions already, uh, please go ahead and, and, and submit them to the chat. It's my pleasure to introduce the following panelists. Uh, first of all, Dr. Raj Bush, who actually was here on Guam in August and who hosted a standing room only circular economy workshop um, at the University of Guam. Uh, Raj is part of the uh, Arizona State University uh, sustainability uh, area and comes to us with lots of, of good um, pearls of, of wisdom, both island and uh, from Arizona. Um, I'd also like to introduce Koti Latu, uh, Director General, Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment Program from Samoa. Uh, our own Monica Guzman, who is the Executive Director of Guam Unique Merchandise and Art, or GUMA. And Nate Maynard, a Research Associate from the Chunghua Institute for Economic Research in Taiwan. Um, I have some questions, so I'd like to go ahead and, and get started um, uh, with Nate, if we can. Nate, are you there? I'm here. Great. Okay. It, it's it's nice to see it's nice to see you again. And I think as one of the questions that was in the poll um, alluded to, most of the attendees and many in on the island are very very much concerned about about uh, trash and recycling. Um, as Taiwan is also an island, what lessons can we learn from what Taiwan has done and is doing, and perhaps may face? Um, under the current circumstances? Sure, uh, thanks for that great question. Um, I think there's a lot to learn from Taiwan. Taiwan, um, just 20 years ago, had almost no recycling. And before that, in the early 90s, Taiwan only had a 70% collection rate for trash. So that meant that 30% of their waste was going into the environment or was being littered. And within 20 years, Taiwan went from having a very low collection rate and low recycling rate having one of the highest recycling rates in the world. And they did that through uh, really wise policy, extended producer responsibility, and also pay as you throw for trash and accompanying laws. But it was also a very large cultural change. So there was a large, massive education uh, program that went out and, and people had to change their daily lives dramatically. And now, now, for example, I wait outside for my garbage truck and I have to carry the trash myself to the truck. And so I was really excited to see so many people concerned about the circular economy because that really, that cultural change is really the first step. Clearly sustainability and a circular economy um, are all heavily impacted by behavioral change. Uh, I'd like to address this next question to Raj um, uh, because I know that uh, ASU is working very closely on inclusive circular economy. Can you help us discuss what that is, uh, Raj? Yes, uh, thank you, Jackie, and good evening from Arizona. Um, uh, yeah, inclusive circular economy. So for the last couple of years, we've been working on this concept of ethical circular economy, tying it to the sustainable development goals, 
trying to work with private sector organizations and help them better understand understand their value chains and where waste might be and and uh, try to help solve that potential problem. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, over the last 18 months or so, we've been now talking more and more about the inclusive circular economy. And the idea is that there are segments of society that are excluded from the formal economy. They're marginalized, they're underserved, they don't have access to resources, to knowledge, to uh, the skills that are needed to start a business. Uh, and the idea of an inclusive circular economy solves two, two problems with, uh, with one solution, if you will. Uh, we can you, we can use waste to start new businesses and create new jobs for people that currently don't have access to those kinds of knowledge and physical resources. Great, Th thank you, Raj. Um, Kosi uh, from Samoa, what other uh, island lessons can be learned from what's going on in Samoa that can be part of the um, the learning lab? how we can learn from that and also bring that conversation to the greater circular conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Smarati, uh, for the question. Um, I, I think uh, the turning point, one of the turning points for Samoa was last year during the Pacific Games. Uh, we took advantage of that opportunity to actually um, uh, convey the message to the world and to the Pacific that this was a, an opportunity where we could actually start looking at changing things. So um, we, 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 we worked with the government to get rid of all the uh, plastic uh, water bottles. So none of the plastic water bottles were actually circulated to four or 5,000 athletes and, and officials that attended the meeting. I'm uh, sorry, the, the Pacific Games. Uh, but we also encouraged um, local businesses to start looking at uh, producing local materials. So instead of, you know, uh, your usual uh, plastic containers, we had a couple of uh, um, innovative business people who started looking at making, uh, um, you know, uh, plates, uh, cups and uh, bowls and spoons from, from the bark of trees. And, uh, and that's something that, you know, um, it's, it needs to be revived. It's something that we in the past, and, uh, but we also learned from some of our other colleagues uh, who were doing it in the FSM, Federated States of Micronesia. So I think the Pacific Games last year was a, a massive turning point for someone in terms of learning how to go back to some of these natural systems and, uh, and actually uh, in then encouraging uh, small businesses to start getting involved in the production of these uh, uh, products using local materials. Uh, and we saw that at the Pacific Games. So whilst the officials and the and the, and the, and the, um, the athletes were actually uh, provided with reusable bottles, the, the food uh, itself that were being purchased and circulated at the number of um, uh, sporting venues were using these, uh, you know, uh, plates and these spoons that were made from from uh, from uh, the bark of trees. So these are just simple, the simple things, but these are things that actually add up to the problems that are facing not just Samoa, but also some of the Pacific. So basically, what, what are some of the key lessons? Is going back to the natural systems that we used to and, and encouraging local businesses, small businesses to get involved in the production of these uh, products using local natural means. So, I mean, that's, that's something that we from Samoa. And that's a perfect uh, segue, if you will, um, to Monica Guzman. And the basic question is, you know, how does our culture tie in to the circular economy? How does culture and our behavior uh, affect what we do, um, no matter how small the action is? Monica? Um, thank you, Jackie. And uh, thank you to the CIS team for putting this virtual conference together. I am uh, honored and uh, pleased to be here. Um, the, our, our Shemar customs, I mean, like other people said earlier, we uh, have been practicing circularity. We just never called it that. Um, in Guam, um, with the uh, arrival of the Chamorros 4,000 years ago, they had to survive and use um, products that were sustainable. And throughout the years, throughout Western contact with, with, with the uh, uh, 
uh, trade with the uh, galleons for our, our Chamorros in the 1500s, and then of course during the war, and um, our, our ideal of sustainability, reuse, recycle, repurpose, have been um, ingrained into our minds. And with modernity, we have had the, um, uh, we, we went into, um, uh, not practicing these sustainable practices, but we um, it, it's ingrained in us and it's just a matter of reawakening that ideal and that practice in us. And uh, we're doing a little bit of that in Guma and um, I'd be happy to talk more about it. But yes, it's ingrained in us and all across the Pacific in island, isolated island, um, um, uh, territories, we, it, it's, it's part of our culture. It's the Pacific way. I was just going to say I had a conversation with some people specifically about island circularity and in particular the conversation, Monica, as, as, as you were, were, were alluding to, really focused on, and in, and, and in Guam people would know this, uh, the notion of tsensuli. Yes. And of course, the notion of, um, of uh, inefamalic. And so the idea of reciprocity and mutual respect, while we didn't call it a circular economy, that's exactly what happened pre-World War II. I mean, certainly when we were about 95% sustainable and how barter and um, an exchange of goods and services kept us um, not only protected, but sustainable throughout a number of, of uh, uh, wars and, and tragedies and such. I think that notion, while we don't call it circular, I think um, is something we've been practicing um, for generations. Um, absolutely, Jackie. And um, one of the things that as Pacific Islanders and across the way, and I'm sure Kosi will agree to, to this, is that as Pacific Islanders, we're cultural innovators, and we always um, are open to adopting and assimilating new technology while maintaining our traditional knowledge. And so we've done that for the last several hundred years, and we continue in this um, uh, uh, being cultural innovators, reciprocity, chanchuli, um, just doing what is good and, and renewing our commitment to our land, our people, and our oceans. And, and I think th the situation that we're in right now is really identifying and highlighting a lot of that as many of us start kind of going back to basics, whether it's doing our little tiny mini farms um, to helping. I mean, there's just been an explosion of, 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 of our community helping each other no matter what. And even if the community is going through real, real difficulties and challenges, not only physical, but also mental and spiritual, um, I think what we're also doing is we're learning to, to go back to some of the basics that, that, uh, that you and I have talked about many times. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things I'd like to, to bring about, um, uh, Kosi, is, uh, again, you all had hosted the South Pacific Games, or what were, were known as the South Pacific Games. Um, as we're going through major challenges, uh, and as we're learning about what the islands are doing, what can we also learn moving forward? And, and, and I'm, I specifically speak to a couple of notions that are, have really are gaining traction. Um, one of them is called uh, over-tourism. And the other notion is called slow tourism. I don't know what you know about either of those, but if you could kind of speak to the idea of, of learning what we've learned over the past and framing a more sustainable um, visitor industry in our islands. Thank you, Marathi. Um, I'm not too familiar with the two terms, but I can tell you uh, we may call it something else. <laughs> um, but uh, it's interesting that you 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 mentioned this uh, point in relation to tourism because you know as as we all know, um, tourism is at is is zero at the moment in the Pacific. And I think we have a new opportunity to actually do tourism differently than what we have been used to. And one of the things that we, we really, uh, and we're working with our, our local tourism uh, um, agency here and hoping that, uh, that they will bring in a lot more of this 
there's a lot of emphasis on the cultural side of tourism in Samoa, but we want to see more um, use of uh, cultural products. Um, you know, we want to see use the use of you know uh, basket, you know, coconut baskets rather than you know your plastic bags. Although single-use plastics is now banned in Samoa, so it's it's a it's a mentality thing. It's a it's a it's a behavioral issue, but we're beginning to see a little bit of that, and so. The tourism sector is an ex is an excellent, I think, sector where we can actually bring some of these cultural innovations, uh, which is part of the you know broader circular economy. Um, and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to it because, uh, as I said, uh, tourism has been really really hit hard here in the Pacific. But I think in restarting it, and there's already talks between New Zealand and Australia, uh, discussing what they call a a, a bubble where they were looking to extending it to the Pacific Islands. And I think that they need to be thinking of, of the environmental component as part of that bubble, rather than just looking at tourism per se. And if they do that, and we're already beginning to write something to the government here in Samoa, that if they do join this bubble with Australia, New Zealand, and other Pacific Island countries, they need to be talking to them about the uh, environmental opportunities that now are presented to us because of COVID-19. So COVID-19 is all negative for, for most people, but I think it presents a new opportunity for us. So I, that's how I see things heading into the future. I, I, I agree, and, and speaking with Raj with regard to being inclusive, um, the conversation certainly in many of the islands has always been, how do we assure that our local community and our local um, uh, 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 values are really at the forefront of how we provide the best possible experience, while at the same time providing opportunity for, um, for, our, for our islanders. And I think, Raj, when you talk about certainly inclusive circular economy and, and ethical um, uh, circular economy, I think that's where sometimes that conversation is. Yeah, that's exactly right, uh, Jackie. I think the, the things that both of you and uh, Monique were also talking about, the cultural aspects, uh, it's ingrained in the culture for hundreds, thousands of years, and this is about bringing it back and reconnecting it into the modern economy uh, and using the modern economy in a way so that everybody does benefit. Uh, what I would like to do at this point is to bring in um, Nate because there are a lot of questions that are being asked specifically about solid waste management because we're really at um, a at, uh, tipping point or maybe we've reached a couple of tipping points with regard to solid waste management and here in Guam um, uh, recycling uh, the recycling pickup was stopped a couple of months ago when we went into a, 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 a lockdown of sorts. How do we manage that? And in particular, some people are, are, are talking about, you know, we haven't had recycling, what do we do? How do we individually um, work to make sure that, that uh, we don't end up um, in, building the trash into our, 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 our uh, landfill that's, uh, being filled quickly uh, day by day. Nate? Yeah, sure. That, that's a good question. Um, that's a tough question. I, I'm not sure exactly how to get out of a solid waste management crisis in the middle of a pandemic as well. That's challenging, but I think that this gives a, an opportunity for breathing room to sort of reassess what is and isn't important. With, with Taiwan, which is where I have the most experience, and not saying that Guam or any other Pacific Island or island should should copy what Taiwan does, but rather look to those principles and experiences. Taiwan actually protested heavily uh, at the end of its martial law period to fight against landfills. And so then the government came back with the proposal for waste incinerators. They proposed building 36 waste incinerators. Um, the people were able to successfully protest and cancel, I, I think it was 11 of those waste incinerators. And so even today, certain waste incinerators around Taiwan are below capacity. And basically it's because of that public demand for recycling and, and waste reduction. So it's not just that the Taiwan was recycling, it was also decreasing the total amount of waste produced. There's, there was food waste composting in 2001. And this all came from a strong grassroots advocacy network. So I think during this time where recycling is paused, you can evaluate your own waste generation because this is a rare opportunity to see how much waste you create. 
and then also to to put pressure on the government to ban single use and disposable items to implement food waste recycling and composting if you don't have it and to implement recycling and waste reduction strategies in general. Uh, there was another question that came in and it had to do with um, extended producer responsibility and maybe you can help us uh, to explain what that is and is it just for imported goods or or locally produced goods? Sure so extended producer responsibility in, in general if you look at every country that has a really high recycling rate they also have extended producer responsibility. Korea, Japan, the EU, EU countries, I believe Germany was the first country to implement it and essentially with extended, extended producer responsibility, manufacturers have to pay per each uh, packaged good they create or whatever good it is. It could be refrigerators, it could be bottles. It's typically known as a bottle deposit in the US. They pay for each of those goods. They put that into a central fund. In the case of Taiwan, it's called the recycling fund. And then you use the money from that fund to build recycling and waste management infrastructure. And today Taiwan's fund is, I believe, around 30 million US dollars per year, it could be more, and they use that for educational programs since they've already built out so much of the recycling. And it does include imported goods. There are a few exceptions. I believe wine bottles for some reason aren't included, but you know, if you buy a can of Coke, that goes into the EPR fund and it's, it's recycled. And um, along those same lines, Taiwan also imports waste from other countries to recycle it here and Taiwan does a lot of the bottle recycling. So if you buy something from Adidas or Nike that's made of recycled plastic, there's a really good chance that that's from Taiwan. That's because of the EPR scheme. Um, I I'm gonna leave this up to anyone who wants to pick up on this question. Um, from the from questioner. The questioner. In my opinion, In my our opinion. best approach at circular economy is for islands to transition back to regional interdependence and away from colonial dependency. The question now is how? So I'll, I'll uh, chime in with a little bit here and maybe uh, others can add, but uh, that could be part of the answer to have regional economies or, or a smaller local economy, uh, because that's the way it used to be hundreds of years ago. Without transportation of goods and materials the way we have it today, uh, which has led to the global economy, uh, which is, uh, it's great, it works, it provides access and, and affluence to a lot of people, but uh, it's also led to some of these problems. So maybe uh, a hybrid version of that is what is uh, required. And that's why for Guam, for example, um, Austin mentioned about 80, 90% of, of the goods and materials and the needs of Guam citizens are imported every year. And very little of that is sent back out in terms of recycled materials uh, with some limited revenue coming from that. Uh, Jackie, you mentioned uh, previously that Guam had approved uh, extending the landfill and, and allocated funding to that. So that just continues that old model or the, the, the global model of let's keep importing and let's manage that system. Uh, the circular economy tends to say, well, Maybe there is, there is a hybrid version of having a local economy or a regional economy and then limited global economy or you know, connection into the global economy. So there's a balance of that that needs to happen. I'd just like to add also to that that, you know, what we need to do is, is awareness and education on um, the circular economy. And we're doing a little bit of that at GUMA. Um, one of our programs is a 12 week customized uh, training module that we partner with the SBDC and it's free for anyone to participate in. Um, the goal of the, the training session is um, to build capacity to start your own businesses. And then we're also including a session there on the circular economy. Um, Austin came in and, and made a presentation to our participants. Um, and, but as far as inter, inter, regional interdependence, we need to create the awareness and educate our people first. And the only way to do that is spreading the word a little bit at a time. Small steps or one step at a time. Thank you. And I can, I, I'd like to add to that because Monica, what you just said and what Nate was talking about regarding Taiwan, it was a cultural shift. There was a point in their history where 
collectively they said we are not going to accept the way things are and change that and uh guam has that opportunity obviously every community around the world has that opportunity for that cultural shift so there's some source reduction cultural change that has to happen uh and then source separation and then recognizing that there's value in that material and not just burying it yeah, and I'd like to add one more thing too. Um, Kosi Luta at the Pacific Summit last September. Um, Kosi, what you what you said there really hit home. Um, you said there has to be a paradigm shift in the economic outlook, which includes our in our thinking, and it starts with the mind. And I, I that really hit home for us, especially here at Guma. And um, if you can expand on that, I think I think that would be for the benefit of, uh, of all of our participants. Thank you. Yeah, and we can close out with your comments on that, Kosi. All right. Um, no, no, I, I, th I think others have touched on this. We talked about awareness and cultural change. I think that's all part and parcel of this paradigm shift. You know, any change uh, starts with a, a change in mindset. So that's why this focus on awareness and education that many of you have touched on today is so, so important. Um, it's it, people don't change through programs. Programs only come and are much more effective when there's been a, a concerted effort in terms of of uh, helping people to change their whole mindset. I think that that's where it comes. And I'm glad to hear that there is, you know, in Guam and in some of the other places in the, in, in the region, that there is a concerted effort to bring about awareness and education. Um, I like to say that in Australia, and New Zealand, 30 years ago. Uh, if it wasn't for a mind change and a culture change, uh, those two countries wouldn't where they, they are at the moment. They had a massive problem with solid waste. And it took a massive awareness campaign uh, to change, to start changing people's mindsets. That they, 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 they started to see a massive change. And so I, I think that the message is one of awareness, education, a culture change, all of that are part and parcel of, of this paradigm shift. And uh, it has to be the an, an emphasis and focus of of each and every uh, one of, uh, of our countries but you know i like to say that uh, it starts with the individual you know it starts with with um, the individual you know sometimes we kind of focus on national efforts and regional efforts and, and that's all good but the paradigm shift begins with the individual and so i think those small steps as we have heard today are so so important and I imagine if one village to demonstrate to the rest of the country or the rest of their district or region that they can do it. And, uh, and what a massive change that would be. What a massive uh, influence and impact that would be. So, so uh, again, the message is, is uh, about paradigm shift is important, but I think it starts with the individual. That's where it's, it, it needs to start from. Thank you. And I think all of you, thank you very much for all of your opinions and for your input. Um, and I think that's a great way to close off the conversation. And, and in as much as, as we can change policy, we can change you know, procedures and such, I think in the end, it really is about the individual taking responsibility. How do I, as, as, uh, um, as an Islander, how do I as an Islander work to protect the environment that has, has contributed to my development and to my family. I think that we've seen examples, for example, Boracay, um, Maya uh, Beach, um, that have shut down so that those areas can heal. And we know islands can heal themselves. I think some of us who are able to, to go to our beaches now, um, less crowded, um, more fish, um, less trashed, uh, I think are able to see some of the benefits of not crowding so much. So how do we make this be the opportunity for um, all of the islands and for those that are affected to make changes that are sustainable, but more important, take the future of, of our, our islands and the future of our development to a step where those benefits, which have been self-healing for various natural parts of our, our, our island, those benefits are not only for us, but it's also for future generations. So um, thank you again, everybody, for, um, for joining us. Um, it's been a great uh, conversation, uh, and I'm sure the beginning of many conversations. And thanks to the team um, uh, at CIS for helping us to organize this. 
uh, and move on to panel number two. So thank you again very much. Sidhu Ismasi. Thank you, Jackie and panelists, for introducing us to the principles of the circular economy. We've learned that this is essential to reframe our thinking and to extend our collaborative efforts across sectors to design out waste. We learned that the circular economy is beneficial for our island sustainability, both environmentally and socioeconomically. Now, I'd like to introduce the moderator of Circular Economy Around the Islands, Melanie Mendiola. She is the CEO of the Guam Economic Development Authority, and I've had the pleasure of working with her as she's one of the team leads of the Guam Green Growth Working Group. Before I give Mel the screen, let's see some of the work and products by our next group of panelists. Okay, um, a circular economy is based on the principles of designing waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use and regenerating natural systems. This was, um, this is according to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Our speakers on the panel are all involved in the circular economy in significant ways in their communities. And with us, um, we have joining us, I'm gonna give them a chance to introduce themselves and talk to you about their projects. Um, and uh, and uh, with that, we'll kick off with, let's see, how about we invite Jerry Winata up first. Jerry is the head of foundation for Bawa Anambas Indonesia. So Jerry, why don't you give us a chance to um, get to know who you are and a, a little bit about your project. Hi, uh, good morning from Indonesia, or Selamat Pagi, as we say it in Bahasa Indonesia. Um, my name is Jerry Renata, and at the moment I'm running the, uh, the Bawa Anambas Foundation out of Indonesia. Our foundation focuses our work a lot in the integrated waste management, but very specific for small island communities, uh, especially those who are located in remote areas, because at the moment uh, we feel that there's a lack of innovations and solutions for people who are living in such remote areas and the challenges they're facing are quite different. So what we're trying to do with the foundation is we're trying to work with other partners to come up with um, implementable solutions and also viable solutions that can be replicated in other areas. So with that, uh, I think we're gonna talk a lot more um, in this panel. Thank you, Mel. All right. Thank you very much, Jerry. Our next, uh, our next speaker is Rashvin Paul Singh. And Rashvin is the group CEO of BGBG Initiative and Me Rika in Malaysia. Welcome, Rashvin. Hey, Melanie. Hi, everyone. Good morning and really happy to be here. Um, so yeah, what we do at BGBG is we work on sustainability and circular solutions. So we work with products. These are products made from discarded car seat belts, as you can see. Um, this is products that come from recycled plastic. Yep. As well as um, working with um, different types of waste. And lastly, we have an education subsidiary that looks at creating new innovative products through our makerspace. Excellent. All right, and our last speaker is someone who's very familiar to Guam. He's made multiple visits here. Um, his name is Matt Simpson. He's the CEO of Green Banana Paper in Koshrai. Matt, do you want to take a moment? Half a day, hello, everybody. Uh, half a day. Um, I am Matt Simpson. I'm from uh, Connecticut and Michigan originally and moved out to uh, uh, Marshall Islands in 2007 and then Koshrai in 2008 and just love the island here, love the life here, and wanted to um, 
give back to the island and create uh, something sustainable and um, that will help the community. So I started uh, using the waste banana trees and turning them into products. And it's been about six years of doing that. So that's what I'm here excited to uh, share about with you guys today. All right, excellent. So let's go ahead and kick off um, with this panel. My first question to the panelists, uh, can you describe how your business or project is circular? And for, to make the distinction, a traditional business involves picking the product you want to sell and then sourcing materials involved from factories, wholesalers, and et cetera. For your products, did it start with this? Did it start with the products first? Or did it start with the waste material you wanted to turn into something? I'd like to ask, um, let's go ahead and uh, get going with Matt on this. Sure. Um, so our, our uh, business definitely started with the waste material. Um, basically, I saw a uh, documentary and got a tip from a friend that you could use the banana tree um, for, and find fibers inside it and make, people make stuff with it in the Philippines and India. And so I did the research, a um, couple years of research, then a couple years of just trying it. And eventually we became uh, very skilled at, at uh, using fiber and paper. So fiber and paper can be made into endless products. And um, we've done a lot of market research and um, trying to make useful products with a story or with a message. So we chose wallets due to their high value they're shippable, um, everybody uses one pretty much, and people attach their identity or their personality to it because they're carrying it, it's carrying every, you know, their ID card even, um, and they, they use it you know, all the time. So uh, wallets was a great choice. Business cards um, was another, is another product that naturally is also very high value piece of paper, and we love that we get to be a part of people's lives in that way. And, um, but it definitely started with the waste material for us because we don't have many resources on this island on Coast Ride. Um, most resources are very limited. So this is kind of a rapidly renewable, sustainable, unlimited resource, one of the very few that we have and we're using it. All right, great. I'd like to turn it over for a moment to Rashveen. How about you? Did it start with the product you wanted to create or did it start with the waste material you wanted to diverse, uh, divert from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the waste stream? Thanks, Mel. Um, I'm going to echo Matt over here. I think for us, it was also quite the, you know, we were regular urban city folk um, on the large island of Malaysia and we came across the waste um, abundance of urban waste that was PVC banners, plastics, and I think from the waste, and then it kind of sparked all these light bulb moments. And we were like, okay, what could we do with this? And then we went into the product um, ideation phase to discuss and look at what type of product would maximize this intrinsic value available within the materials um, or waste materials that were found. And then we got into developing the products. All right. Now for Jerry, it was a little bit different. Um, Jerry, will you please uh, talk to the audience about how your foundation brought the pieces together uh, to, resource, uh, to solve the resource issues of Bawa Anambas? I saw on your website that your foundation's involved in education, outreach, capacity building. How do you prioritize which problem is in most need of your attention? Um, yeah, thank you, Mel, for that. So, correct. So, because we are a non-profit foundation, so we came in from a slightly different angle uh, tackling the issue. It's not so much about prioritization, to be honest. It's more about looking at the bigger picture as a whole and sort of like looking at into faces, uh, which one, which work that we need to do first. Because um, I don't think one can move forward from uh, uh, different phases altogether. So um, where we are right now, we're focusing on what Matt and Rajvin has accomplished. Uh, I think that's what we aspire to be, um, to empower the community and, the, and the, the local community to be able to produce such high um, level and high quality products that have economic value. Um, I'm just going to quickly share just to better explain um, what we, where we are right now. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to do this. Can, can you see it? 
Yes, right. I can see it. So um, the foundation is working with um, a private entity, a profit making entity called Bawa Reserve, which is a sustainable resort out of in Indonesia. And we, at the moment, we're working in three villages. So what we do, we basically have a program investment. So we invested in two villages to build a resorting, uh, waste resorting unit, waste storage unit, and uh, also teach them how to separate the waste. So this is the education part and also the investment part. And then with that, we are moving all the recyclable waste to one specific village where we built a um, recycling center where the recycling center are building or making um, simple products at the moment that includes uh, eco bricks and also candles. Now, what's very important for the foundation is to closing the loop by ensuring we, we can use the products and bring it back to the villages or working with the resort to be uh, so them to, to absorb some of these products. So there's a direct economic incentives for the community to, community to do this. Um, and all this are run not by the foundation, but everything is run by the community. So the role of the foundation is basically to, to make sure the community are able to do this. Again, this is, we're in a very, very early stage. We're only, we're barely two years old. Um, and this is happening right now. And we are hoping that this, uh, this model can be improved and also can be expanded to the rest of the islands in Indonesia. Thank you for that answer. So now, I think the audience would appreciate knowing how much waste are we talking about here? And where would this waste be if your business products weren't around? Um, back to Matt. Thanks, Mel. Um, so we, we uh, bought a fiber extractor machine in uh, November of 2014, and that came from India. And we made our first paper in February 2015. So going on five years later now, um, with about two truckloads a week or 6,000 pounds of, of stems, that equals out to around like 1.2 million pounds of, of waste stems recycled. And these would otherwise be left in the jungle to rot. Um, I don't know if everybody knows about banana trees, but they're, um, they only produce fruit once and uh, they, they grow very rapidly in about 10 to 12 months. And you, when you harvest bananas, you cut down the stem that grew that banana tree to make room for the next stems. So these are something that uh, an agricultural waste that would, uh, is always chopped down and always wasted unless somebody is using them for fibers or mulch and it doesn't really make great compost. Um, so making paper or, or fiber um, yarn or anything would be the best solution for these natural fibers that we have here in the islands. And yeah, so over a million pounds recycled. Really proud of that. Right. A comment from one of our um, audience members. I'm going to read it to you. Um, there are indicators other than a recycling rate to identify how successful um, there are, in, uh, there are other indicators other than a recycling rate to identify how successful circular economy initiatives are. At a business level, adding value to resources that were not used before might be one example, such as with the banana paper. Also designing to avoid waste creation from the very beginning and helping the consumer and incentivizing him to participate on a circular model. Um, I'd like to talk for a moment about designing waste out uh, from the very beginning. Maybe we can hear from Raj, uh, Rajveen about this? Yep. So I guess in terms of designing waste products from the very beginning, um, I think that goes through quite an interesting process, like any product design process. And for us, we would actually, we actually tested the intrinsic values of the material quite a lot. Its strength, its durability, what would it be best used for? And then, so that was the first part of the circularity. But as we all know, like even though you use waste materials, um, what can end up happen is that that product also has a lifespan. And in its typical three to five years or hopefully longer, it could end up in the landfill again. So what we've done beyond that is we've also created a take back model where now if you create a product and it's, you know, over time the bag strap is not working, you are able to send it back to us. We give you a lifetime warranty of fixing your product. And we've realized one more challenge with that is about half the products are sold outside Malaysia. So that makes it quite hard to bring it back or it defeats the purpose. 
So now we're looking at how we could create simple education tutorials of how you could fix your own product. So that is empowering the consumers in the design phase, in the um, yeah, circular economy phase. Circular economy initiatives rely on behavior change from the perspective of consumers choosing products uh, that are made with this in mind, how companies view waste and how waste is minimized in design. Um, I think you've, you've, you've hit on it very much. And I thank Matt for also answering the questions directed to him. Our Zoom um, question box is blowing up. I'm happy to see questions coming in from all over the place. Um, now, Turning it back to Rashveen for a moment here, your products are diverse. You know, you have the small scale uh, plastic recycling that I saw on your website. You have waste to art installations, um, ethical fashion, um, which you spoke about a little bit earlier and we saw pictures of up on the screen. Where do you see the biggest impact from the perspective of people getting, um, of getting people to change their behavior, uh, keeping the circular economy in mind and to reduce the waste that they produce? Um, so I guess, Mel, in all honesty, I think the part that has been most impactful in creating behavior change has probably been the art installations. Um, so we get to work with a few um, different corporates over here and we get to work with either it's their industrial construction waste or some is post-consumer waste, right? And somehow I think art has a really powerful and provo provocative way of getting people to think about um, their consumption patterns. The challenge I find sometimes with the products that we make, um, which are upcycle, is that people tend to think that if I buy this one product, I've done my part, right? So there is this mindset of like true consumerism, I'm actually solving the problem, which is probably not entirely accurate, right? Or it's not good practice to promote. So what I try to do quite a lot is we, the art part I think really helps to shift and like be a bit provocative. The products part come in to provide you a meaningful alternative. Um, but I think the last banner has to be education. And that is something which I think the University of Guam is doing a fantastic job. Yeah. Jerry, can you comment on this as well with regard to behavior change and which of your many diverse projects you think have the biggest impact on changing um, the people in your community's behavior towards um, minimizing waste? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so we're working in the very remote areas. We're talking about, you know, the closest big port that we can get to can take up to 26 hours on a boat. So, um, and access and logistics are very limited. With that said, the community in the Anambas region, um, they're quite detached with modern technology and they're quite detached with them. Um, with the new way of living, which means that their way of living have not changed for generations. You know, they, they've been chugging um, waste or trash in the ocean for generations. But back then, the food wrapper are made of from banana leaves or from organic materials. But now the whole world has changed um, and the people in their numbers are still trying to keep up on like how to do this because they have no idea how to do it. So. Um, the program that we do, I mean, the KPI that we have, the big objective that we have is actually trying to change their mindset and looking how to look at waste. Um, and because they are a typical fishing community that they, they don't know how to do all this. So when we come in, what we're trying to do is just we're trying to show them alternative and also trying to make them realize that their value in waste, they're not just garbage per se, but as Rajvin and Matt has proved, proven that it has value and it has economic value and it could be a really good source of alternative livelihood. Um, and that's kind of like what we've been showing. But again, I think the key here is also a multiple partnership. Having, I think um, the last uh, moderator, Ms. Jacqueline, I think um, alluded to the role of tourism. Um, and in this case, because I'm working with um, with one of our big partners and donors is actually a sustainable uh, resort. And that has created a massive benefit and also to help to create a market immediately. So by looking at opportunities, not just the products that we can produce, but also the market that we have around the areas and how to connect them immediately. I think that that has brought the biggest sort of like um, way of looking at um, this waste product, uh, uh, the waste management issues. 
All right, very good. Now a question from the audience from Kyle Dahili um, is a question for Guam, but I'd like to, I'd like each of the, the speakers, each of our panelists to answer this question. So um, one word answer is our rate of transitioning uh, towards a more circular economy too slow, on pace, or interstellar? I love that word that he put. Um, and uh, so from each, from the perspective of each of your communities, so let's go ahead and start with Matt, then we'll go to Rashveen and then Jerry, and then I'll answer for Guam last, of course. And, uh, and, and uh, everyone can say what they think. So too slow, on par, interstellar, one word, go. Rush? Too slow. Okay. Way Jerry. too slow. <laughs> Matt, was that Matt saying too slow? Yeah, too slow. Too slow. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, what is our best shot at achieving a regional circular economy? Um, I, I, well, rather, what is the best shot at re, uh, that in achieving a, a circular economy a little bit larger than just the community in which we're operating? So for Guam, it would be Guam Mic and Micronesia, I would imagine, or Guam in the Pacific. And uh, what, what do you guys think? What is our best, what, what do you think we need to do to make it, uh, to get a little further along on this? Um, if I would just jump in here, I think that behavior change is really key, but the challenge with that is it takes time. And I think right now we need to accelerate that. We need to like give that steroids. So I'm like really looking at policy and stricter regulation as the means of driving behavior change. And I think the other part is really technology that we need to make it more accessible. But I think because we are in a critical time, um, I think it calls for policy. That is the big, big, big winner over here. Just kind of transitioning into economy. Let's well, let's let's kick it over to Matt. So Matt, what do you think needs to happen? But I mean, just at the local level, with regard to your employees in Koshrai, do they see the significance of what you're doing from a resource conservation perspective, and does it inspire any kind of behavior change from them? Thanks, Mel. Um... Definitely, like the whole purpose, the main purpose for me doing what I do is to create jobs and livelihoods for, for people here um, so they don't have to leave the island and, and they don't have to join the military or work um, at, a, you know, at a restaurant somewhere um, away from their home islands. So um, my, my employees, the job is the most important part. Um, Resource conservation out on the islands is kind of very in your face and already happening. Um, so we're not we're not so changing our, our personal behavior too much, but our goal definitely is to start conversations about sustainability and ethics in the products that we make and the materials that they're made with and like the labor conditions of the people who are making them. So I think our staff are really proud that people are talking about us as a unique example of resource conservation um, everywhere. You know, many companies believe that they need to sacrifice profit um, when they choose a more sustainable approach. And there's been a few questions in the um, in our Zoom group chat uh, alluding to this with regard to how much does this cost or how much does that cost. Um, can each of you weigh in on this, on having to choose between profit over, um, over a more sustainable approach? Uh, I'd like to go ahead and point this to Rashmin. Yeah, thanks, Mel. Yes, I noted a question from Deborah as well on this. And I'll have to speak for ourselves um, here just to not represent everything. I think the reality is that our products do cost a little bit more than regular products, um, 30 to 40 percent more. And this really comes down to because of the fair labor wages that we insist on, on putting in place. Um, I noted what Matt was saying also with machine efficiency and tech marketing, and that I think is super important as well. Um, I think what the question about profits is that I don't think you would have to sacrifice profits. I just think you need to recognize that you are unable to play in that mass produced factory game and you would have to really angle your product branding and, and your product um, demographic to a whole different spectrum. Um, but the challenge again here is keeping it affordable, right? And that is, yeah, the big question in, in the room today. Mm -hmm. Yes. What about you, um, what about you Jerry? 
Um, so for this question, I think I would need to speak on behalf of the resort itself, where I also play a bit of a um, advisory role. So uh, as for the res uh, for the reserve, they don't see this investing or providing this funding to the foundation's work as part of their CSR, but it's part of the investment. So it's not so much about reducing profit, but it's more on securing revenue in the future. Um, that's why the, the funding came from the resort to do this um, integrated waste management system and also a lot of the conservation work that we do around the area. It's just part of the investment part. Um, and we also bring that, like Rashvin said, like um, making sure that's known and making sure that's part of our branding um, and also getting support from the guests. So it's actually by providing this sort of like up front and center, sustainability front and center for the resort as part of the investment, we also um, attract a different type of clientele, a different type of, um, of guests who came to the resort. Um, and they don't see that as paying more for their stay but they see that as being part of, um, of the sustainability journey as a whole. Great, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for that answer. How about you, Matt? Any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, uh, a lot. I, we definitely sacrifice profit for sustainability, but I think that that's important. And profit's not, a, as, as we all know, you can have way too much profit. Um, that's been going on for a long time in society. And so it's today though, it's never been cheaper or easier to start a business. Uh, you know, the cost of entry is super low. You can do it all from your computer or phone even. And um, I think sustainability will get cheaper and cheaper in the coming years. Um, machinery, small like semi-industrial machines, that's my favorite to research like, you know, what machines can I buy and what, what can I make? Um, packaging, that's all getting more sustainable. And uh, single-use packaging is definitely on the out, you know, and um, the scale of, of uh, producers making sustainable materials or um, these things for small, for uh, people that want to get in the sustainability, bit, uh, you know, business somehow is um, increasing and the costs are going to go down. So um, I think it's a wise move for people to sacrifice profit in the short run for sustainability. Consumers are, de are demanding sustainability more and more. And, um, you know, unsustainable business, mass produced stuff, uh, it has a lot of high hidden costs on the society and on the environment and companies should be taking social responsibility super uh, seriously and winning the hearts of, you know, their customers through in that way and, and, and in a, uh, addition to making good products. Um, so I think, yeah, the old ways are going and the new sustainable ways are coming and this whole shift happening right now in the world is a great time to, to uh, start, start something new. Great, excellent. I read in a journal article by Valenzuela and Bohm that governments and businesses need to come together to really drive change in, uh, the, in moving our circular economies forward. And this is how broader global change can be accomplished. Um, can I get, uh, let me see, can I get uh, Rashveen and uh, Jerry to weigh in on your governments, um, how supportive are they of, of your work and what you do? How about we start with Jerry? Sure, thank you so much for the question. So yes, uh, the work with the foundation, I think um, we work very closely with the government. So we do get massive support from the government, but we also have to realize that uh, we're working with the local government, so not really in the national government. So at the local level, uh, we get massive support from the government, but we're also realizing that they are out of the depth in certain things because they, do, they don't have enough resources. Um, the area that we work in, we have 45,000 people only. That's considered tiny for Indonesia out of 270 million. So 45,000 people across 255 islands, that's a lot of ocean to cover uh, with a very minimum resources. So realizing that it's not that they don't have any, they don't want to support, but they just have very limited uh, resources. And the foundation um, have a luxury that they don't. And I think this is a, there's a, there's a statement of questions by Hardy Tan, um, which is a very interesting one, saying that uh, lots of new tech emerging these days uh, handle solid waste management efficiently, but because it's not proven, they don't want to take a risk. 
that's absolutely correct. And especially for governments, they don't have the luxury that the foundation has. We have the luxury to fail. We have the luxury to learn from our failures. So what we try to tell our government counterparts is like, why don't you let us try out these crazy ideas? And then when it works, come along with this journey with us. When it works, please come and implement it. So that's kind of like how we work at the local level. And um, it has been working quite well so far. And so the, the short answer is yes, we do have the government support, but fully realizing they cannot, um, there are certain things that they're not allowed to do or they're not incapable to do or they don't have the luxury to do. Very good, very good. Rajveen, how about you? Do you have a community and a government in your community that's very uh, supportive of the work that you're doing? Um, yes, I would probably have to echo Jerry over here. And I think it's interesting on, on the surface, so we do have a government that is appreciative of the fact that this needs to happen, that our waste problem is out of whack. We are recycling at about 12%, which is one of the lowest um, in the ASEAN region, right? But what I disagree with our current approach is that I think the government and the big companies have gone on this big approach of putting the responsibility on consumers that, oh, it's your fault because you're not recycling, right? And I think that is a very cheeky or sneaky way to work around and absorb responsibility from the big manufacturers who are, you know, um, production responsibility. For example, what we've seen over here is we've got the 10 biggest FMCG companies, right? The Coca-Colas, the Nestle's, the PepsiCo's, they've come together to form a coalition called a circular economy um, working group, right? And instead of, it was very interesting in the beginning and then I was quite, I was following that quite a bit, but instead of looking at their manufacturing practices and take back policies, they're putting in place a series of videos of how people can recycle more, upcycle more, which I think is a bit cheeky and definitely going around the actual problem. And I think our government is not doing enough in calling a spade a spade. Hey, excellent. Okay, we're running out of time. We have a lot of questions in our Zoom uh, group chat. So I hope you stay behind for our, um, for our virtual, what is it called? A virtual happy hour? <laughs> virtual, oh man. I much prefer happy hour. Um, uh, if you were to mentor someone with a passion similar to yours, so some of our audience is listening to what, they're, what you're saying, I know they're getting inspired and they say, I want to take the next step. If you had to do this all over again, what would you tell, what would you share to somebody who has a similar passion and just wants to get going on some kind of project towards um, a circular economy type of project? Let's go ahead and kick off with, um, let's close this out with Matt first. Thanks, Mel. Um, I love talking to young, enthusiastic people. So I would tell them just like to follow their passion. Of course, if they're not passionate, then they're not gonna wanna work hard when things get tough. And to, to take time, you know, realize like how long things take, things take years and uh, you can't be um, too uh, in a rush and you gotta enjoy the process. Definitely don't go into debt. Uh, I think uh, if it's possible to avoid debt, work as hard as you can to avoid debt. It's terrible. Uh, I think it's a really tough way to, to uh, start something like this. It's not financially sustainable. And uh, ask a lot of feedback from friends and family and um, keep it simple, as simple as possible, and uh, have fun. Excellent. How about you, Rashveen? Can you weigh in on what you would tell, um, what, would, what would you tell your younger self getting, getting going on a project similar to you, to yours? Um, yeah, I would have said start sooner, definitely the time to do it, right? Um, you know, like there's never been a time that the level of public knowledge and appreciation for this is there. And I think Matt is spot on to say that avoid debt, um, right? Debt will come later. Debt will always find you, so just avoid it. Um, but networks, guys, honestly, like I learned so much through the people I met at conferences or even virtual ones that saved me so much of time in sourcing alternative products in design perspectives. So really be very creative with how you work with your resources. We tapped into a lot of international talent, um, volunteers from the UK, from the US, from Europe, who were on summer breaks for three months, but super top talent. So they helped with the design work. Um, yeah, so be very creative. You don't need a lot of money to start, but I think 
if you're good at leveraging off your networks, you have a really good chance to make something happen. Excellent. And lastly, Jerry. Well, uh, coming in from the nonprofit sort of like entity um, and working in this sort of integrated waste management system, it's great to have for anyone out there who's willing to sort of like join in the nonprofit se um, sector is, is a great work, is rewarding. Um, but activism and altruism alone is not enough. Um, you need to be entrepreneurial, learn from enterprises, learn from people who are um, managed to, uh, to turn this into profit like freshmen and Matt, uh, because that is so important to, to have the two, um, the two sides together to actually help, you can actually help a lot more people uh, on the ground and a lot of communities on the ground that needs them uh, with your um, entrepreneurial sort of spirit and wit. Thank you so much. I love that. Activism and altruism is not enough. Get your networks together. Try not to go into debt and uh, get something off the ground. Make a movement. Start something, start, something, start, start something amazing. I'd like to take this time to thank our panelists for their, uh, for their uh, participation today. Um, I think our audience learned a lot. They were certainly very, very engaged. Our Zoom group, our Zoom group chat is blowing up. And I hope you stay behind for the virtual happy hour. Reception. Reception. <laughs> and have a wonderful rest of conference. Thank you so much. Wow, now I know what I want for my birthday. Thanks Mel, Matt, Jerry, and Roshwin for giving us an insight look at your businesses and how they incorporate circular economy principles in our region. Even though the audience's microphones were on mute, I could hear the wheels turning in their minds as they began to envision how to implement more circular economy initiatives where they are. Thank you all for attending week three of the University of Guam virtual conference series on island sustainability. And thanks again to our partners and sponsors for helping make this virtual conference possible. Don't miss next week's program when we'll present our signature CIS Seed Talks, Ideas Worth Cultivating, featuring change makers from the Obama Leaders Asia Pacific inaugural cohort. To moderate the Seed Talks, we are pleased to have Andrea Park from the Obama Foundation, who leads their international programming in the Asia Pacific region. Join us next Friday, Guam time from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. and Thursday if you're across the dateline. The virtual reception will start shortly. And if you can't make it, we hope to see you next week. Sizu Maasi and have a great day. Viva Island Sustainability and Viva UOG. I just want to give you guys a quick reminder that you can turn on your videos if you want to um, say hi and wave to people and uh, be on the screen and ask other people questions. Um, Professor Kirk Johnson said that Guam produces 300 tons of trash each day. That is a lot. Wow. All right. Elsa has a question. 
Well, Elsa's asking a question probably to one of the panelists. Um, Elsa Dumulinare, who is the Associate Director of the Center for Island Sustainability, she asks, how long does it take to develop a product that is ready to sell and where do you get your startup money and expertise? Is there anyone yeah. in the room yeah. who wants to um, jump in and answer this question? Like for instance, for the banana um, paper, right? And uh, the wallet, how long did it take to actually have that nice sellable product, right? And how did you get the startup money to really have that ready? And who did you have to pull in to, to make it happen? Hi, Elsa. Thanks Hi. for your question. Um, I, so I started researching in 2011. I didn't uh, make any purchases or anything until 2013. I built a factory in 2014 and ordered machines to be brought in and started making paper in 2015. So it's been years and years and super long process. And I, I uh, fund everything up to this point with two other businesses um, that I run. One's a t-shirt printing and design service and one's an import company for like computers. So those, what I'm doing is taking an unsustainable business, the profits from that and putting it into something that's more circular and more sustainable. And the expertise just literally is from Google and YouTube and <laughs> trying and failing. Wow, cool. <laughs> Monica, would you like to um, respond to that question as well? Um, yes, thank you. Um, our experience with Buma is it sometimes takes a year and, and that's the minimum time. It actually depends on the concept and the product. Um, what we try to do in Buma is we ask for participants to um, come up with a prototype and see if that works. Um, so, it, with Matt, who required, um, you know, extensive type of machinery, it could take longer, but if it's, uh, but it, but in our experience, it's, it's a year, a year and a half. And funding, um, with Guma, we, we provide grants to incubators. They have to uh, uh, make a presentation and do an ask, and um, we're working with, um, uh, we're re really fortunate that we have some good um, corporate partners. Um, we had our initial funding from the administration for Native Americans uh, through a grant, and then we've continued the program through a corporate sponsorship with DFS and then our government partners with GIDA and the Guam Visitors Bureau and the Guam Council of Arts and Humanities. So, um, yeah, it actually all depends on the project, the product, and um, what type of um, business you want. Thanks, Monica. Thank um, is there anyone else who's in the Zoom room, whether your video is on or not, uh, who is uh, working in a circular economy business or trying to do a circular economy product? Feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and speak. Hi, um, I just wanted to come and this is Michelle from Micronesia Climate Change Alliance. I just wanted to talk about our precious plastics program. <clears throat> um, we have been working on this for probably about a year. Um, we, we, on the Precious Plastics website, they give you um, all the schematics to make the machines. Um, we didn't go that route, we chose to. We, we found um, somebody on the Precious Plastics website to, out in Oregon who made the machines for us. So it took several months to make the machines and then get them shipped over here. And for the past, I would say two months, we've been playing around with the machines, um, trying out different plastics, had a lot of failures. Um, but recently in the last three or four weeks, we have been successful in making products. Although we aren't ready to fully launch yet, um, we are, going to be accepting plastic items this week, Wednesday and Thursday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Plastic numbers number two and number five. Um, if you would like to come drop them off, we're located in the Harmon Industrial Complex. We just ask that you clean your plastics out before you drop them off. 
Thanks, Michelle. I'm uh, starting my stockpile of plastics two and five to give to you guys. Um, I have a lot of yogurt containers that I would like to see go to good use. So thank you so much for having the precious plastics uh, machine in your office. Yeah. Um, let's see. Anyone else want to contribute to the conversation? Feel free to like raise your hand. We have you on gallery view so we can see all of your wonderful faces. Oh, Amanda, Amanda Ellis, I see you're in the Zoom room. Would you like to um, uh, echo or restate some of your points about fossil fuel subsidies and elaborate a little more on that? Okay, half a day. Aloha, everybody. Congratulations on such a fantastic series. I think as a boring economist, this is a point that I keep hammering, but actually plastics are only artificially cheap because the fossil fuel industry is so subsidized. The IMF data for 2017 is 5.2 trillion. That's trillion with a T. So when you look at the fact that President Trump is likely to give them another trillion dollars as part of the bailout, it's absolutely no wonder that plastics look artificially cheap. There's also the broader issue of full cost accounting. And the fact that the manufacturers of plastic do not have to pay for the damage that disposal of their products creates, whether it's trash in the ocean and islands or the landfill costs, means that in fact, there's a double whammy. So the circular economy would actually be way cheaper were we not to be artificially subsidizing fossil fuels. Same goes, same argument for renewable energy, but I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that plastics are actually petroleum-based products. So thank you for another great session, everybody. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks for joining us again. Amanda was one of her keynote speakers last year in Guam, and she was the moderator last week for our conference, and it's good to see you again, Amanda. Um, so I'm um, going through some of the Zoom room chat. Uh, we see that there are some comments about our current economic system, uh, capitalism. So uh, we have 10 more minutes. So, um, so capitalism is this global structure that we're pretty much in. How is that contributing to our current state and what um, can we shift uh, to uh, make um, our economy work for a better environment? Because there's this profit motive. Uh, what if we reconfigure our thoughts and see the earth as our profit instead of money? Um, I think Kyle DeHelig and Minyeka and Dr. Johnson all had some good points. So if any of you are still in the room, um, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Oh, hi, Senator Sabina. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah, just some thoughts, about, <laughs> some thoughts about that question. Um, you know, uh, in the, the current capitalist system that we're in, um, there's a lot of externalization of environmental, environmental costs and social costs as well. So I think in looking at, um, you know, how can we build, um, you, know, uh, you know, obviously we're going to consume products, right? So, um, but how do we mitigate that? And I think really extended producer responsibility is really critical uh, at this point. So, you know, when we talk about zero waste, um, you're looking at how, you know, producers can start to engineer their products so that they can take back um, whatever whatever's remaining after the life of the product. Um, so I would, you know, that is, I think, probably in looking at how, you know, with the plastic situation, yes, it's a, it is one of those externalized, um, you know, environmental costs. And it, it's left up to the government to figure out what to do with it. But I think really the, the responsibility should be more on the corporate side and how they, they produce these products. I mean, if you look at Germany, uh, when you're done with a product, they take back the plastic. So how the, what they do with that, uh, I'm not too sure, but I feel there should be a holistic perspective in how these products are made. And I think even like, you know, you know when I look back at my parents and how they, they lived on Guam, everything was valuable to them. They saw reuse of their products. Um, and, you know, seeing it, seeing the product not just have a one time um, purpose, but multi purposes. So this book I always t tend to refer to is uh, Cradle to Cradle. 
um, by Will McDonough. And the book itself is curated. Uh, the book, the material is plastic. Um, and the idea is that why don't we uh, match the duration of the material to the use of the material. So a lot of the materials that we use are one-time use. Uh, the you know plastics generally last um, you know many years. Um, so he was thinking that if we assign the use of these durable materials for more of the the long-term purpose. So books we we tend to want to keep around for a long time, which is why he thought that it was per uh, it was a purposeful use of plastic. Um, but again, yeah, if we can reduce our use of oil. Um, that would help reduce the consumption, uh, the use, the production of plastic, um, and you know, moving towards less consumption uh, and then more mindful production of products. Thank you, uh, Senator Sabina. Um, and next on deck, we have Mel Mendiola, our moderator from the last panel session and CEO of Gita. Um one of the pieces of research um, that uh, floats around in the financial uh, world, in the personal finance world, is that above a certain amount of money, people are only marginally um, more happy. So in economics, there's this concept of diminishing marginal returns. What that means is for every little bit more, so if I'm drinking a can of soda, uh, the first sip gives me the most satisfaction, and then after the first sip, it's le you know, less and less and less. Um, with regard to this, um, there's been research to show that right about at like the $75,000 a year mark when it comes to salary, people aren't much happier when they're not much happier when they make more than that, a dollar more than that, a thousand dollars more than that. And as that goes up, people's level of happiness kind of levels off. And so when I think of um, this sort of discussion about capitalism, I think that um, when it comes to when it comes to businesses and operation, this is the system that exists, and for the most part, these are the constraints we have to deal with. Um, and I think the point of a lot of our panelists today was, uh, when behavior change starts with the consumer, then the consumer, when the consumer recognizes that it's not this more is better kind of situation, but that um, the best quality that doesn't uh, harm the earth, and when when that becomes a more holistic kind of uh, formula into consuming, uh, then that's when it doesn't matter if a capitalism still exists, it's doing what it's meant to do, but it's doing it with a purpose. Thank you, Mel. Um, we have about five more minutes left and I want to give the opportunity um, back to Kyle Dehelig. Hi, Kyle. Hi, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I just want to say um, this was a, has been a really great a virtual conference session today and I, I really enjoyed everything. My question is how can we um, design new products when it comes to circular economy? So is circular economy just a, a re-adaptation from the products that we already have and just finding uh, new um, materials to make those products or are we trying to make new products? Uh, let's say like a, a giant telescope that can read minds, I don't know, made out of recyclable materials. <laughs> That's just my question. Thank you. Would any of the panelists like to answer that question? Okay, well, I could take a stab at answering the question. Um, the circular economy, so the current kind of structure we have right now, right, is you have um, resources, you extract them, you make them into a product, you sell it, and then you throw it away when you're done, and then you start buying things all over again. So the circular economy, um, I think, is about two different things. It's about finding resources that um, won't add more waste into the system and can generate um, more products or be biodegradable or add something back to the environment and um, within our economy as well. And also about diverting things from that linear path. And that's why it's a circular economy. We want to have something from cradle to cradle. That's the term I've heard before, instead of cradle to grave. You don't want to have a product that um, is born from a resource and then has a lifespan that dies and then that material can never be refurbished into anything else. So you wanna have a product that has a circular lifespan and could um, keep 
adding into the system. So sort of like composting. Composting is a very um, rudimentary way of thinking about a circular economy. You have produce, you eat it, whatever uh, waste you have left, you put in your compost bin, it turns into soil, you grow something from that soil. Thank so you. we have Thank about you. two. You're welcome. Um, and we can talk more later. Um, we see each other a bunch. Well, not anymore, but we used to before the pandemic hit. Um, Menyeka, did you want to respond to anything? Oh, sure. Um, I've been lucky enough to be connected to a whole slew of um, climate warriors and activists around the world who really are honing in on the source of a lot of the impacts of climate change um, and, and dating it back to colonization and a lot of the injustices associated with, with capitalism and capitalism, as we know, is really thriving off of exploited, exploitation and extraction. And there are ways to make and move the entire planet to a more regenerative way of being, the circular economy being a huge aspect of that. And I think the basic thing, um, when, I, when, I, when we're all thinking about the economy is that the base word for economy is home. And if we keep, treat, uh, if we keep creating more um, ecosystems or if we treat the, if we remember to put the home aspect and the eco back in economy, then uh, we'll treat it a lot better. We'll, we'll remember that we're all interconnected and we'll have um, just a lot, a lot healthier relationships along the production line for any business. Um, and it's really important that we all realize that, that there's so many people that are negatively affected by this current economic system. And the more that we provide justice uh, in our working environments, then we can all move, move healthier in a more harmonious way with each other and with um, our resources and the planet. Thanks, Benyeka. So we are just about out of time. I want to pose one last question to um, someone. Um, I don't have anyone in mind, but um, hopefully we'll just get one response. Um, what are, does anyone have any thoughts about how indigenous knowledge can help us go back to the circular economy or an economy that's more circular? Hi, Lauren. Uh, this is Senator Paris. I just have a quick comment. I think one of the things, the, the strong points about our indigenous culture was the collective aspect. So we shared in the resource and rather than in this particular economy, it's more individualistic. So I think if we can get back to that community centric idea of sharing resources, I think that is one way. Thank you. Um, and I'm seeing a, a suggestion to call on Minyaka again. Minyaka, did you have a, another response to that? Oh, uh, I definitely think that there's so much uh, indigenous knowledge and wisdoms that we haven't tapped into, especially when it comes to uh, using our resources in innovative ways. We have lots of products um, and trees that we don't know use of and lots of uh, artists, people who make medicines and lots of local artisans who already do a lot of things, but don't make things to a scale that, um, or aren't providing things at a scale that could really grow this economy and there's so much more that we could and I'm very thankful for Guma for all the work that they've done in um, highlighting and enhancing the local makers here. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of indigenous knowledge, especially that have not, especially around the ocean that we haven't really um, tapped into yet. There's transportation is a major issue in getting products from one place to another. And there are little works on every different island about uplifting navigational skills, but if we could do it on a bigger scale and a more, um, in a more uh, intentional way to do it, to increase the economy and to, to get goods from one place to another, I think that would be enhancing both our culture um, by uplifting traditional knowledge and, um, and, and moving our things around in a, in a healthy way. Thanks, Manyaka. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really hopeful for our future because what do we have to live for and what do we have to do to get to a place where we can uh, be sustainable if we aren't taking action now and figuring out what wisdoms that we've had in the past that we're not tapping into anymore, how can we even progress forward? So um, thank you everyone for uh, hanging out in our virtual reception. We are out of time, that went so fast. 
Um, I would love to ask if you guys would not mind just like smiling so you take a screenshot and um, we'll share it with you on our Facebook page and our website. Okay, um, I guess I'll do the countdown. Ready? Okay, three, two, one. Okay. One more. Three, two, one. Okay, did we get it? Oh, one last one. I don't know whose eyes were closed, but try to keep them open. <laughs> okay, ready? One, two, three. Oh, perfect. We got a um, thumbs up from our, our team. So thank you so much. Thank you for uh, tuning in today. I hope to see you guys next week when we have our Seed Talk um, presentation, Island uh, Ideas Worth Cultivating. Uh, have a great day. If it's happy hour where you are, uh, have fun with that. I'm going to have some more coffee. Bye. <laughs>